So I'm here with Geordie and uh, we are cooking up some venison pies from our recent trip to New Zealand. No, <laughs> it wasn't New Zealand. It wasn't New Zealand. I want that idea. <laughs> Recently we were in New South Wales hunting fallow. Geordie got his first fallow dough uh, and this is some of the awesome shoulder uh, that came off that fallow. Uh, thanks to Dodge from Accurate Hunt for taking us out. You can watch that hunting video if you want to by heading over to the link in the description or above. Uh, but we're here to kind of give you the comprehensive video on how to cook venison pies. Yeah, fowl pies. So take us away, Joy. What are we doing? So we're going to start with deboning our shoulder. So we're going to take all the meat off this and we're going to keep that bone and we're going to put that in our slow cooker because as that cooks down, you can get all that lovely marrow come out of it and that'll give flavor to the pie filling. Then we're going to take our diced shoulder, we're going to dredge it in some seasoned flour with some salt, garlic powder, paprika and mustard and some black pepper. We're going to fry that, get it nice and crispy so we get it all brown around the edges. And then we're going to pop that into our slow cooker, prepare a little mirepoix of veg, which is onion, celery, carrot and a bit of leek and some garlic. We're going to fry that off, get that into our slow cooker as well and then prepare a lovely stock slash broth which is going to thicken as that fowl cooks down and gets lovely and tender and then we're going to chill that overnight and as that sets then we're going to make our pies with some puff pastry and a lovely egg wash nice okay so we got dodge's fowl shoulder so we've got about just over a kilo with the bone out that's going to be a lot less obviously it's a fowl so it's a bit smaller yeah then we're going to dredge that in some seasoned flour we've got plain flour some garlic salt black pepper mustard powder and a bit of sweet paprika we're going to dredge that and fry that in the saute pan and then we're going to make a mirepoix of onion celery carrot and leek we're going to fry that off with a bit of garlic and we're going to add some diced potato all to our slow cooker and make a lovely broth with beef stock some gravy powder some worcestershire sauce and a bit of the leftover flour from the dredging and then we're going to put that on slow and then we're going to cook that you know, eight, eight hours till it's all falling apart and that bone, all the marrows come out of it. Chill that overnight and then get that in our lovely pie molds. And um, do a bit of egg wash and then we'll have some venison pie to eat. So this is our shoulder off the fallow. I imagine this looks like the one that I hit just next to. Dodge has trimmed it up for me. Um, so we've got the join here. We're going to debone this meat off and then we're going to split this down the join so it can fit in our slow cooker, but you could easily just throw that in. So we'll just take a couple of long cuts along that bone line. And we just want to, just like filleting a fish, you want to stick as close to the bone as you can. While getting up as much meat as possible, because that's going to be the meat that you get in your pie. And the knife you're using is a deboning knife, isn't it? This is a fillet knife for a fish. Yeah. <laughs> but essentially, it's a very similar style. Knife. Something with a bit it's of a something with a bit of bend in it, because you want the bend to be able to go around the bone. Like for example, here on the shoulder, this is the scapula of the deer, so it's long and flat. So you want a knife that can stick to the side of that scapula and get around. Because you want as much meat off it as possible, because that's what you're going to put in your pie. Yeah. Well. While you'd be putting the bone in the pie, you're obviously not going to get as many chunks. And there's nothing, there's no part of this meat that we can't use, right? Like it's, a pie is pretty forgiving in terms of oh, what part of the... Yeah, exactly. Like a pie, you know, a lot, a lot of hunters will make a pie because it is an incredibly friendly way to approach gear meat. Yeah. You know, every like Australians, we love pies. I'm not Australian, but you know, <laughs> I found out from I got here that we all love pies. And um, so you could give this to anyone, and it's going to just taste delicious. And yeah. such a good way to use up those cuts that, per, that need slower cooking. So you've yeah. got neck, shoulder, any of that rib meat that you take off if you don't want to leave it in the woods, which you really should bring home because that's got all lovely connective tissue in it, mm. which is going to break down in that slow cooker and just make it taste even better. Mm. So that's the scapula. Put that one off. And now we're just going to get the rest of the shoulder. I'm taking this bone, it's going to be shorter. This one's super fiddly. Very much so. It's, it looks like the classic cartoon dog bone. So <laughs> with the, with the, two, the two little bulges at each side and the muscle, the way it sits around it. 
You want to get as much of that off as you can, and then we're going to dice it up. And you see, now that's that silver skin that's coming out. Mm -hmm. And that's going to break down in the slow cooker. So everyone says, oh, cut out all the silver skin. Okay. And like, that's if you're going to cook a stick. Get okay. that bone out. Silver skin is just going to cook down. You want to cut it off the meat, but still put it in the pot because it's going to guide a lot of flavor to that meat. Yeah. So you just want to trim that up a little bit. And then we're going to cube this. So we've got our two bones. We'll put them in the stock yeah, pot. Give that to, oh, I'm not going to give that to the court. No, dogs are getting those on. We'll put that in our slow cooker. So when you cut this up into small pieces, you can trim a little bit of this off. But I mean, like I said, a pie is very forgiving. So a little bit of fat is going to just be delicious. Don't don't trim it too heavy. Mm. This is only a little fallow dough, so we don't want to lose much meat. Yeah. And you just cut it into cubes that are about you know, just over a centimeter, just over a centimeter each way. You don't want it too small because then it's gonna there's gonna be no texture left in your pot. So so this is the issue that I have when I do it. My wife, it's either way too small or it's way too big, and I get in trouble no matter how I cook it. I never get it right. It's like yeah, just like that, just a centi just over a centimeter yeah, too. That's a good chunk. Because then you get a lot of browning on the outside, which is where the flavor, that savory flavor yeah. of your pie is going to come from. And you forget as well how big that's going to be in a pie, right? Because you're, yeah. you're cutting it just like to your mind, but when you actually put it in the pie, it, it, it will, will it shrink? Yeah, so it's going to shrink over cooking, but it's also going to break down. Then we're going to cook this for a long time. Mm. So it like it's going to be smaller than what we start with, yeah. but you also want a little bit of chunk so you've got something to bite into. Yeah, yeah, so don't go too small is the key. Yeah. If anything, kind of go a little bit bigger than you Yeah, might. because when you're cooking it for a long time, when you stir that, it's all going to break up. Yeah. That looks so good. That rich red meat. And just, you know, there's one bit that I'm not going to keep in. That's just a little bit of fat and, and connective tissue that I don't want in there. It could yeah. be gristly. So I haven't been too um, meager with it. No, no. I've only taken one little piece out. Dodge has done a pretty good job trimming it up. <laughs> and then we're going to get this into our bowl. Shout out to Dodge's Dodge Tips. <laughs> Dodge's <laughs> Dodgy Facts. Get rid of this and wash your hands. So we've got our we've got our fallow meat here, uh, deboned from the shoulder. This could be neck, this could be rib meat, anything that needs a bit of a slow cook. You can do back leg with this. Like I mean, just because it's from the back leg, it just probably won't need to be cooked as long. So we're going to put in this a couple of teaspoon heat teaspoons of plain flour, some seasoning now for it. So we've got some garlic salt, about that much, a couple of cracks of black pepper. And this all just depends on what you want to, like, what's your taste? You know, you could go Moroccan with this, you could go Italian with this, Greek, you could go lemon and oregano, Moroccan seasoning, whatever takes your fancy. I like a bit of mustard powder and some sweet paprika. And then we're just going to get in there with our hands and we're just going to fingertips, just tease that meat. Just make sure it's all got a little piece of and um, flour on the outside because that's what we're going to develop our color. We're going to brown it, right? Yeah. So that's that. We'll get the pan on, wash your hands, and then we'll do some sauteing. So you want to get this pan really hot, okay? So, do you know, a lot of the things that people do, and it'll be the biggest difference between someone who knows how to cook and doesn't, is they're going to you know, turn that pan on and think it's ready straight away for frying. It's not. That whole pan's going to get really hot. Don't put any oil in it yet. Just let it come up and up and up. And then when you put your oil in, wait again, because that oil then cools the pan down again. You want that oil to be, Joe, you can hear, you can put your hand over it, blah, blah, that's fine. But when you drop that first bit of meat in, you want to hear that sizzle, because that's going to give you that brown crust. Put a bit of oil in there, not too much, just enough so that it's going to think. And then again, leave that be. I even got a new pan for you. <laughs> Shout out to Coles for the free pan. <laughs> you see the way it's starting to shimmer, and it's not, just sitting there, you know, it's almost moving around like one thing. Mm. That's when you know it's getting there. So it's all kind of homogenized together. And if you want to test, you, know, you can test is... with a wooden spoon. If you see bubbles, it's hot enough. And that's the moisture evaporating out of the spoon. The spoon. So that's not hot enough. Spoon. And then we're going to fry the meat in two batches because you know, if I dumped all that in at once, the pan's going to go cold and you're not going to get any of that browning again. So you just, you know, it, it's worth taking the time 
to do it in two batches so you get that lovely brown flavor because that's where the savory in a pie comes from mm. like you know you put in gravy powder in it f- fair enough but also like that brown of the flour that's what gravy powder is made from mm. so if you, mm. you want to get more of that um that crust on the outside which will lend itself better to the dish this is the challenge as well i feel like with guys and guys cooking at least the challenges that i've totally found you just want to chuck it all in yeah. and it doesn't actually help uh, oh, it's terrible it's like trying to cook noodles at home Joe, if you've got a, it's all good having a yeah wall you just want to chuck yeah, it if you it. don't let it get smoking hot to the point where you think it's going to catch fire yeah you're just going to have terrible soggy noodles <laughs> and it's no good <laughs> see it says on our head yeah. yeah that's what you want to see and you want to just not overload it too much and best don't just dump it in drop it in piece by piece that's why it. why do that well you're just going to get a better crust on it if you dump it all in at once and it instantly start moving it around with a spoon you're not going to like i'm going to drop this in and i'm not going to touch it for a few minutes as it develops a nice color on it i might tilt the pan to get the oil to come around oh but you're not moving the meat not going to move the meat off that thing because you know, it can only fry what's touching the pan that's a good point so you don't want to break that crust straight away you want to just leave that and that will take you know five to ten minutes so we can chop up some veggies. To go with our meat and our gravy, we're going to make a, a sofrito or a mirepoix, which um, is onion, celery, carrot, and I like to add a bit of leek as well. So we'll cut all that up into a small cube, nothing fancy, just whatever's easiest for you to cut it up. And then we're going to fry that off with a bit of garlic and add that to our gravy. And as that cooks up the thing, all well, the carrot and the celery and the onion is going to break down and make that gravy just much more wholesome. Mm. This is not the way most chefs are taught how to cut an onion, but I was taught by a Chinese chef called Wei just to knock the back and the front off, split it down the middle, peel that outer layer of skin, and I'm always I don't mind about getting that bit of onion as well because you can make stock out of this, and then we just knock that off, keep that for later. And you got half an onion here. I go down the middle, making little slices. And the tighter you make these slices, the smaller your onion dice is going to be. So you cut it the whole way across there. And what you're going to do is just going to come from the side. Notice I'm keeping my knuckle bent, yeah. touching the blade so that you can never cut yourself. Roll it over and just keep going. And you got a small dice. Not the French way, but it's the way that works, especially when you've got a big Chinese flavor. <laughs> and we're going to do the other half, so we're going along again. And you can make that fatter, you can make that skinnier, you can do these cuts longer. But the closer you keep them together, the finer your dice. And that's what you want, because you want it to almost melt into the sauce when, you, when it's cooking. Yeah. And nice onion, and no, no crime. <laughs> I believe you said no crimes. <laughs> <laughs> no crimes. No culinary crimes. No, maybe against the French. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next. Leek. I've just knocked the bottom of this off and knocked the top of it off. I'll use the top for other stuff, but you want the white part of the leek for this. It sautés up the best. Cut it up the middle, in the quarters. Sit side by side, and you just want to... Rock your knife, tight as you can get it. Same principle with the knuckles. Right? Yeah. And this one, this is a slightly different type of cut. You're, you're rocking that knife. Notice the way the, the tip of the knife never really leaves the board. Mm. It's always stuck there. And yeah, as I get tighter and tighter, I can never go too close because my knuckles hold it away. And also, if you're going to wipe the knife like that, make sure you're not running your finger along the edge. Now with a leaf, I don't know what it is about the way they're grown, but there's always going to be a little bit of dirt in the top of the leaf. So you just chuck it in the colander, give that a rinse. Back and have a look at our meat. We'll just slide it on the pan, maybe knock a few these chunks out of together, move them apart, and we'll have a little look too. So mm. it's getting brown, so that can go a little bit longer. Next up, celery. And you know, these bases that you make, this mirepoix, this sofrito, whatever you call them, 
Cajun Trinity. That's the base for so much many dishes. Cajun Trinity. The Cajun Trinity? Yeah, so the only difference between this and Cajun is there's no carrot in Cajun food. They use green capsicum instead. And they call garlic the pup. I'm not too sure why. <laughs> so yeah. I've just shredded this lengthways and then same thing with the rock in motion just to get a little cube. And that's going to fry up nice and easily. But yeah, these are the, like, these three vegetables plus garlic are the base of nearly every good soup that I make. Um, stews and sauces, sauce for can, anything like that. Gravy, and it just works so well. Then knock off the edge of the carrots, just square that up. Like, do you say you're wasting that bit of carrot? I'm going to chuck that in a pot with some stock. Mm, I was just going to ask that. That's a generous top of the carrot. <laughs> oh, it was a bit bent anyway. <laughs> So, trick for cutting carrots, you want to take one sliver off the edge and then roll the carrot over it. So uh, now you've got a flat, flat side surface. and now you've got a lot more perches for when you want to cut that. And you want to just cut slivers like that, roll it up on the other side and then cut into little battens. They're too big to be a julienne, but that's the kind of style you want. And I would just keep them all side by side, just like the celery. Rock it around and back to that roll in motion just to get a little cube. There you go. Nice. Add that to our celery and carrots, and we'll get a bit of garlic and we'll go back to our meat flip. You can see all that red has started to come to the top of the meat. Just like that, that's when you know you, you're brown. So that's the blood coming out of it? Well, it's technically not blood, it's myoglobin. Everyone said, oh, my meat's bloody. So it's not, it's myoglobin. I feel like I need to put a, a <laughs> subtitle of what that word That's an Irish man saying. <laughs> M-Y-O-Globin. Globin. <laughs> Ask your doctor or your butcher. <laughs> He'll tell you what it is. So it's like a German word. Yeah, I don't know. Myoglobin. <laughs> It's, you know, it's probably not easy, right? <laughs> we can check that. We'll just flip all this meat over and we want to get the same amount of colour on the other side. Not shaking it about too much, just flip it once back on the salt end. So we're also going to add to this pie mix. Probably not going to need both of these potatoes, but we're going to take one big potato, peel, and we're going to do it into a slightly bigger cube. So cut one side off, roll it over. And this is just going to help to thicken the sauce as it cooks down. So just a bigger cube. And what's in the potato that's thickening the sauce, the starch? The starch in that potato, but also, you know, if you have mashed potato, you, know, it, you could add mashed potato to a stew that's not thick enough and blend it in. And that potato itself is just going to Mm -hmm. There's a little cheap tip for you. So big cubes, and we can drop that in with our bones, and um, because we're nearly ready with our meat, and then we'll make the broth. All right, so we've got a lovely, nice brown on all of that meat, and we've still got a couple more pieces to go, but we'll drop this into our slow cooking. So that's in there. We don't need too much oil here, just another little bit. We get our last. Uh, bit of meat in, but again, we're going to let that pan come up to temperature for a minute. And don't worry about this seasoned flour, don't throw that out, we're going to keep that, and we're going to use that to help thicken our sauce. Because with a pie, like if you were making a stew, you could be, let it be a bit runny. But with a pie, you want that filling to be almost solid when it's cold. Mm. Because when you cook it, it's obviously going to leak. And um, yeah, the thicker you can get it, the more sauce you keep in that pie, without it all leaking out the side. This is going to be, it depends on how much meat and potato you got. Uh, we, we'll make the sauce, but then I'll also show you how much liquid you're going to need. You don't want too much, otherwise you're basically going against everything you're trying to do, making that pie for them thick. Mm. So we'll get some water. We'll start off with about three cups, 750 ml. Might be a little bit much, but we'll see. We got our water. We're going to take that quarter of a cup of beef stock. Now don't worry, because this is cold water, it's not going to dissolve straight away, so that won't matter. We're going to take a good glug of Worcester sauce. Can you say that for me? Worcestershire? Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> Worcestershire. Knock that in. Give her a little whisk. And this is 
basically every pub, every restaurant, seat, not secret, because everyone knows what it is, it's Maggi gravy powder. It helps to thicken, it helps give a savory flavor. It's like crack. Like <laughs> Maggi noodles. Yeah, Maggi. do you get a chicken snitzel with chips and gravy? This is the powder they use. You can get it from a lot of places. <laughs> and you want to knock that in, you're probably talking about a cup. And now it looks, you just want to whisk that powder in. It looks like a lot. But don't worry, we can add more water to this if needed. But I really don't think we're going to need any more water. By the time you've added that Worcester sauce in. What way? Worcestershire. Worcestershire. <laughs> You're already at 900 mil now. Yeah. A couple of cracks of black pepper. And that is going to be the basis of our bread. Apparently, when they invented Worcestershire sauce, they tried to create a sauce with anchovies and other savory fillings and they tasted it and it was terrible. So they put it in the back of a cupboard and two and a half years later, they pulled someone it out pulled it out and awesome. tried it again and that's the recipe, it hasn't changed since. Really? Yeah, so like anytime you go to Wussar where they're making the sauce, there'll just be barrels and barrels and barrels. They just let it and they have to let it age. So we just want to push that down so you mix and meat with potato, pushing that down so it's nice flat and level. And then we're going to fry our sofrito and then get that in. This is my leftover duck fat. So I've made confit duck out of this. So you know, confit is a French way to preserve duck. You salt it, cook it in fat, and then leave it covered. It's the origins of the word larder. This is lard. Yeah, yeah. Food used to just sit covered in fat. In a, in a larder. In a larder, not refrigerated or anything. Doesn't look great at room temperature, but when this turns into an oil really quickly, and then we're going to fry in it and it makes the most amazing roast potatoes. Mm. It adds any kind of savory flavor to a dish. So we'll just put a decent teaspoon or tablespoon in to our oil instead of putting oil for our sofrito. And I'll add a lovely savoriness to it. Mm. This has still got a little bit of time in it from when I cooked our duck. See, it doesn't take much heat to get that all in with our sofrito. And this, just toss that around. You didn't want to clean that pan in between frying the meat because see all those little specks? That's the fond. The fond from the meat and it's just going to add to the flavor of the dish. Once the needs to start a bit, we'll get the leeks in. We'll fry them for maybe six to eight minutes until the onion's gone nice and translucent. Bit of garlic in there. Another couple of minutes until it's fragrant. Get that in the slow cooker. This is another stage where you want to take your time. You want to cook that sofrito down because if you put that straight into the slow cooker, I know you're cooking it for a long time, but it's not going to have the same savory flavor, that same depth to your dish. It needs saute and to help it come down a little bit quicker, just a little pinch of salt. So now our onion has gone translucent with our leeks. You see that there? We're going to put in some garlic. Now some minced garlic. Obviously, being a cook, I've got quite Big a lot. Big old toe of garlic. <laughs> Big toe of but you know, two or three cloves, cut up fine. If you want to turn it into a paste, add a bit of salt, just mash it with the side of your knife, and then get that in. And you want to cook that again for another couple of minutes, just until you can start smelling that garlic cooked down. If you put it in straight away, it's going to be, it's going to be too raw, and it'll be really overpowering. So we'll turn that off, just push that to the side. You see there's no liquid in there, so you know you're done and we'll get that into the slow cooker. And we'll just pour that over all of our meat. And that's gonna break down as this cooks. We made this stock for the pie, but just make sure you give it a little whisk before you get it in. Now, I said that we'll find out how much we need, because you don't want the liquid to go above the level of the meat, because then that's gonna be too much for it to cook down, and you end up with a sloppy pie filler. So look, we're only a little bit short, but you can see there that it's, you can still see the tops of the meat. Mm -hmm. Alright, and just another little mix to make sure everything's incorporated. Get that sofrito um, down into the liquid so it can melt away. It already smells like pie. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got our, got our gravy in and our sofrito, and we're just going to chuck the last bit of that seasoned flour in. Now it'll help thicken up our sauce and stir that in so you don't get any lumps. Push it all down 
and you want to pop that on six to eight hours eight to twelve you can overcook this the longer you go it's just going to get more um, stringier and more like pulled pork if you go on the lesser side you're going to have still chunks of meat but will break apart and be tender you can just once you, you know what's done when you put the fork in and the meat is just breaking without any effort cooking our pie fill, you know uh, six to eight hours twelve hours meat's fork tender now we're gonna with a pie filling you've got to cool it down so take that out of the slow cooker chill it off put it in the fridge overnight you can transfer it out into a bowl and then you're gonna end up with something like this so this is our pie filling that's been cooked and cold down and you see how thick and gelatinous all that gravy is that's the perfect sauce that you want and in here we've got we've got our bone and that's lended all its marrow to the sauce and in here there should be one more bone and we've got that smaller shoulder bone now you want to make sure you get all the meat off this as well because you don't want to lose this so we'll set this aside for a second get a clean chopping board and a pair of the old black gloves oh you're just <laughs> going to manhandle it and you're just going to pull that meat off because you've cooked it long enough all the meat will come off this and then afterwards then finally your dogs get a bone so you just want to pull whatever's left of that. Now there shouldn't be much on it. Pull whatever's left off and you'll get a clean bone like that. Okay. And the same. There shouldn't be much left on this. Just enough. You don't want to lose it. And then with what's left here, we'll just dice that up and add that back into our sauce. So have you done anything differently to this pie, given that it's venison, versus what you would do with beef? Nothing at all whatsoever. Maybe if you were using a back leg of a deer, something that didn't need as long as slow cooking, you don't want it to dry out. So you would just monitor your cooking time a little better. You don't want to cook it too long, because then it'll just dry out. So I think this is the concern of many people, is that because it's gamey, you have to treat it like vastly different than you would a normal meat. Um, and in some situations, maybe that's true. But at the 100% same time, in some situations, it's true. But we're not we're not doing a dish here without moisture. It's not going to dry out because we're cooking it. We're we're. Um, Jordy's forgotten a word. Blazing. Brazing. Brazing. So we're not we're not frying this or we're not cooking it in the oven with no liquid around it, so we gotta worry about keeping things moist. We're brazing this in liquid. So I mean that moisture isn't escaping anyway. That's that's staying in the sauce and that's why we make a sauce with it. So this is gonna be just it's just gonna fall apart. It's not gonna be dry, nothing like that. So this has got the potato in it, this has got the carrot, everything's all melted down and turned into a lovely Graving, mm. and that's going to be our pie filling. So we're going to this out of the way. Just standard shop bought puff pastry, nothing special about it. Um, take our pie mold, and we're going to put it upside down so you want to know how big it is. And you're just going to cut, be loose with your cut because as you push it down, you're going to need some extra space. And, and you're not cutting around the edge, you're giving like a little, like a Got, what, half a centimeter on the edge of it? Yeah, just a little bit. And that's going to be our base. And you want to cut something similar for the lid. But with the lid, you want to go right on the edge because you don't need it to be too big. Yeah. And then you can just roll this puff pastry up and use that for more. So is this pie going to be a real pie that has a base and a top as opposed to a pie that's like just got a like top? Like a shepherd's pie? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I hate those pies. <laughs> you missing out half the pie. <laughs> Amy makes those pies, I'm like, that's not a pie. Well, with the bottom on it? No, well, like, it's just like in a little crock pot. Oh, no, I'm, no that's a pot pie. Yeah. No, that's a proper pie. Yeah. You want to make sure you grease this. So I've just got some regular oil. You could do butter, margarine, any, and it's just in a little spray bottle. Just a couple of sprays. Rub it around, just so that when you are finished cooking it, it pops out nice and easy. Now set your bottom in. And this is a trick I learned from an old English chef. With this leftover dough, they call it a podger. I'm not too sure why, I think maybe a bit podgy. And you just use that to push down so you don't put a hole in it. 
Ah. So he gets into the corner of all those pies. Uh -huh. In the corner of the, the pie tin. And we're going to grab some of our filling. And we're just going to... You don't want to overfill it. All right? You don't want to come seeping out the edge and then you've got a soggy pie. But you you got to be generous, too. This is another issue with male cooking. <laughs> you want to cram as much as you can into it. <laughs> but you you got to stop yourself. All right? So we've got a filling. We've got our beers and a grease tin. We're going to put our lid on. Just push down to start. Because you want to create a seal. And the only way you're going to get a seal is when the two layers of puff pastry touch each other. All right? And then you can be fancy as you like here, but... I just roll it backwards on itself, going right the way around, just twisting with one hand and using your thumb to roll the lid back. That's the inside of your thumb, or well, the outside of your thumb. Yeah, well, it depends what hand you are, right? <laughs> and then just push it down, seat it down, make sure all there. Now, with a pie, especially with hot pear fruit. You use fork. Fort, you're going to have to make sure there's some holes in the top of it. Otherwise, the steam's got nowhere to escape and your pie's going to pop. So we've got one pie. We've got some eggs. Now, my secret for a perfect brown top pie is I only use egg yolks for my wash. Only the yolk for my egg wash. And the wash is... The liquid that we're going to brush on top of the pie. So I'm just going to separate... I'm speaking for all the uneducated... <laughs> So we're just going to separate the yolks out. A vastly different colour yolks. Yeah, well, guess where two of these are from. Two from my chickens. <laughs> these are the two. These are Geordie's chickens. This is the this supermarket. Is Cole's chicken. chicken. <laughs> and you're just going to whisk that up. Now you got to make sure that you beat this a bit because if you don't, you're just going to end up with scrambled egg on the top of your pie. So you want to get that nice and emulsified. Just using the standard pastry brush. You know, this is the same thing I use for sausage rolls, any kind of pastry, because it gives a lovely brown top. Okay, and we're just going to brush that on. And be generous. You don't want to be too skimpy with it. You don't need to. You always have more egg than you need. Oh, always. Unless you're doing schnitzels. <laughs> yeah, and then you never have enough. <laughs> That's so true. Yeah, you just keep adding more and more milk and you're wondering where the <laughs> egg was. So, nicely done with the egg wash. And then we're going to get this into an oven, uh, 200, 220, depending on your oven, fan force. You want it hot, because don't forget that pie filling is cooked. Mm. All you're trying to do is cook the pastry. And if you put it into a cold oven, that bottom's not going to cook and it's going to be soggy ass. Mm. So let the oven get up to temperature, another thing. Once that red light goes off, you know it's hot. Mm. Don't put it into a cold oven, because it's going to be no good. A couple of poppy seeds on top. Because, you know, if you're cooking game meat for someone, like, this is what we're about. Like, you want it to look good. You know, people eat with their eyes first. Yeah. And make it look like a pie that came from the shop. Yeah, because yeah. if you want your family to be happy about you going hunting and bringing home the food and, you know, living our life that we love, put the extra effort in. That's a great tip. That's yeah. a really good tip. Now, pop that in the oven and we're going to say, check it after 20 minutes and then we'll go from there. Closer to um, 30 minutes to 40 minutes. You know when they're done, when it's gone lovely and brown on top. So don't pull them out too early, guys, because with the bottom being pastry as well, um, you want to make sure that it's cooked the whole way underneath. So if you pull them out too early, you can get it not quite as, if it's not brown like that, you know it's not done. But we have one that came out a little bit too early. You can see that's not done as much. Why are you touching the pies? <laughs> I cooked them all. I touched them multiple times. Whereas in this, Cook. Beautiful. So yeah, we've got four venison pies, fowl with a little bit of chili chutney. It's going to be terrible because now everyone has to watch Chris Massacre a pie. No, I, this pie I'm going to eat the <laughs> way that you... So what Julie's referring to is when I have a pie at home, what I like to do is I cut the top off. This is for like a dodgy, cheap, cheap <laughs> terrible pie. Cut the top off and then sauce in the middle, churn it all up with a spoon or a fork, and then I eat the filling, and then I eat the top, and then I eat the bottom. Yeah, like a pie taco. <laughs> like a pie I watched it, I've never been so horrified as we're sitting in a pie shop, 
watching him and Dodge ruin pie. But this, I'm gonna eat like, I mean, I don't even wanna use my hands. Well, yeah, I give you the good ones, you'll be able to pick that one up. <laughs> you raise a good point though that um, a pie is like universally liked, and if you want people to understand why you love what you love, why you love doing what you love doing, um, present it to them in a way that they understand, um, in something that they're going to enjoy. Like lower the the bar to entry, I yeah. guess. And a pie is a great way. You could, I guarantee, if you feed this to someone who's never eaten venison before and you don't tell them it's venison, they're not going to know. And, and I, don't, I don't mean that in like a negative sense. Um, like not like you're masking the taste. You yeah. just like. And yeah, there's definitely those two trains of thought where you know you want it to still taste like venison because mm -hmm. you want to celebrate the deer. But if you're trying to get your family into wild game, or you're trying to make it more accessible to people, this is the way to go. Don't just hit them straight away with a bloody stick. Like, a venison stick, yeah. Yeah, go on, give them something that they can approach well. You know, goat sausage roll, venison pie, can't beat it. And like, I've um, given venison steak to people before, and the, so you can see it on their face. There's a politeness and a temptation to be like, mm. It's so good when it's like very different and unusual and you don't want people to feel like they need to say that it's great when they don't when they're not used to it mm. um and then it's not that it's bad it's just an unusual taste that they're not used to and people need to become accustomed to taste before they can appreciate what makes them complex interesting, That's it. You know? i hated coffee i hated coffee mm. i only like the smell you know after a couple of goes now i love a coffee yeah but it's the same thing you know people got to acquire the taste my son eli asked me the other day when when do you think I'll start liking the smell of beer? <laughs> he's 10. He hasn't drunk beer before, but he knows that he, he's not going to like it. And I'm like, it's just something that you... The, like, the like, answer he lies never. <laughs> you can't sell this. Can't give it to anyone. Can't give, it to can't anyone. give anyone gear meat, which is... That, that will only came in recently. Is that, I guess it's a matter that it's... This is not Victorian game meat. Don't that. <laughs> <laughs> We're in Victoria. But oh, don't worry, it's a, it's it's a New South Wales murder. It's a New South Wales dough. <laughs> Very true, but yeah, so full disclaimer, you can't give anyone game meat here in Victoria. I didn't give Chris this, he stole it from me. <laughs> so <laughs> But it is a terrible war that we have at the minute, and it really doesn't make too much sense. Um mm. when all you want to do is in Victoria we're having big problems here with deer. Where people are saying there's too many, we're having a lot of traffic collisions, they're eating a lot of crops, things like that. These are the kind of things that we need to bring back into our community. Yeah. Put, put a value on the deer because Correct. this is this is sustenance to your family. And if you make it a law where you can't give it to your family and friends, mm. th that's a that's a big disconnect from your food. Mm. Take a you show a picture of twenty deer culled mm. rotting in the bush. Take a picture of this pie. And you tell me which one's a better use of the which resource. Which one's more morally acceptable? And, and then the money that's that's gone into the business who's made it and sold it, and the person who's enjoying it. It's um, it's just yeah. Hunters need to become a part of the solution, uh, and the, and the food, the meat needs to become a part of the solution, not the fact that we just go deer are a huge problem and we just need to destroy them. That's not. Yeah. Doesn't 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 work. work. Like, there's, there's people doing great things in this space down here in Victoria. You got uh, mm. Dawa Dawa in the Otways who are using fallow um, harvested from the paddocks that are causing a problem for local farmers. And they they've got the game licenses, um, their harvester licenses, and then they're selling them selling their products. Mm. And that is that's the way we all need to be going. Mm. We just need a an easier way to do it. Yeah, we just need a not be so precious about like the meat being this dangerous thing it's not dangerous at all it's amazing good i mean well, well what can you say it's, 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 it's amazing pie. pie it's a good pie but like i cooked it so <laughs> i can say how amazing it is